this is an example of people who don't look it up. They get their information from a website, from Pastor Google. They look up some missionary website or goes to some missionary book, and they find it, and they go, oh, thank goodness. Get on to our first topic. Uh, Call you live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hey, uh, Rabbi. Hey, William. Hi, this is Lloyd calling from Washington State. Um, I'm a transplant from Brooklyn, New York. I'm Jewish. I came out here. I'm a token Jew. I asked a lot of questions about my beliefs. It's simple to do. I watched your show. I had your books. I was raised Jewish. Uh, but to my question about the genealogy in Luke. Professors, theologians, Christians say that it's Mary's. Okay, let's say it's Mary's, hypothetically. Um, what I'm confused about is Numbers 118 says that the lineage is supposed to come from the Father. However, in the lineage that's presented in First Chronicles, uh, it says that, um, let's see if I get it right here. Um, I can't pronounce his name. Shishan um, gave his daughter to Jahar, the servant, and they bore they have a kid named Atai, and then they got uh, Nathan. So it sounds like there's an exception to the rule where uh, Nathan came from a male that was not from the tribe. If you can just find that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, also, one last thing, if they use Matthew's genealogy with, um, with Joseph, uh, the non-biological father to Jesus, they say that's okay because Jesus was adopted as uh, as uh, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh was. Thank you so much, Rabbi. You made, you've, you made a big change in my life. Thank you. Rukashim, that's awesome. Great question. Go ahead and hang up now, your answer. Thank you. And this question is based on very tired, well-worn arguments or defenses that Christians advance. And for you, the viewers, who may be unfamiliar with what you just heard, I need to explain this. The church has a monumental problem because it's stuck with Matthew and Luke. The central claim of the church is that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, that means many things, but one of those things is that the Messiah is the heir of King David. He's from the Davidic house, from the house of Judah, and he's the fulfillment of a promise that God made many thousands of years ago, King David. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 through 16, God promises David that from him and Solomon, who will build the house in my name, the context is that David wanted to build a temple, and he's told that his son Solomon, who builds a temple, from him will come forth all the kings. That's called a Davidic covenant. The word covenant means a promise. When the church adopts the notion that Jesus was born to a virgin in the late first century, it then inherits a bomb. It then adopts an idea that will shatter the claim that Jesus is the Messiah. Just a little explanation. The earliest books in the Christian Bible chronologically that were written in the earliest stage are the letters of Paul. There is nothing in any of Paul's letters that would indicate that Jesus was born to a virgin. Paul doesn't say anything about it because Paul knows nothing about it. In fact, in Galatians 4.4, Jesus is called the son of a woman, not according to the law, which means he's Jewish, but not the son of a virgin, okay? So that's really early. All of Paul's letters could be dated to the 50s, with the possible exception of 1 Thessalonians, which might have been written as early as 49, okay? The book of Mark is dated to the time of the destruction of the Second Temple. Mark knows nothing about an unusual conception for Jesus. In fact, in the book of Mark, we're introduced to Jesus as an adult, There's nothing remarkable about Jesus' conception, about Mary, is in Mark's gospel. In fact, Mark doesn't even mention Joseph. Joseph is that unimportant. Never mention the book of Mark. In fact, Jesus is the carpenter, the tecton in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. 
not Joseph. By the time we get to Matthew and Luke, those Gospels are written about the year 80 or 85. The idea of Jesus being conceived to a virgin is introduced nowhere earlier. But when Matthew and Luke in, inherit or ascribe Jesus' conception to mir- something miraculous where Mary was a virgin, by doing that, it sabotages the claim that Jesus could be the Messiah. Why? Because in order to be the Messiah, you have to be from the house of David and Solomon. Must. The way a tribe identity is conveyed and conferred is only through the father, as you said, not through the mother. Okay. How do you know that? Well, you could see that Matthew and Luke's genealogies, which are found in Matthew 1 and in Luke 3, respectively, are only chasing men, tracing men. Because only men are important here. Why? Because the Torah says so. The way you identify your tribe is lemishpechaisam levesan vaisam, according to your family, according to your father's house. It's right there in the first chapter of the book of Numbers. You quoted Numbers chapter 1, verse 18, and that works perfectly. So your tribe identity is conferred, is conveyed only through a patrilineal descent, never a matrilineal descent, never, okay? And, And therefore, this creates a monumental problem. Why would that be? Because if Jesus was born to a virgin, then he doesn't have a human Jewish father from the house of David with which he can convey the tribe identity. You see, when you play with a perfect system and you interfere with it and you insert into it an idea that's pagan, the idea that someone's born to a virgin, it's not that God, and I want to say this, you know, Christians will go, well, couldn't God have a virgin conceive? Of course he could. He made a woman out of the side of a man. He created a man out of the dust of earth. H- having a virgin conceive would be a minor miracle. Okay? It's not that virgins could not conceive if God wanted it. That would be a small miracle in the grand scheme of things. In fact, we can observe parthenogenesis going on in the animal world, not among humans. It's never been observed among humans, but it has been observed among other creatures, snakes and so on. But that's not the point at all. The point is that when you tamper with a perfect equation, you get into trouble. When you, it's like a systems theory. You have a perfect algebraic equation and you just change one number and then you have to compensate for everything. And once you make up something, in this case, that Jesus was born to a virgin, you then shatter everything because that illustrates that that person then can't be the Messiah. But in the Christian Bible, how did they, why did they do it then? Because they don't keep track of these things. In the Christian Bible, like how could they have made such an assertion, you're wondering, because they don't keep track of it. It's whatever, it's sort of very sophomoric. Whatever is important to me now, that's what's important. In Luke's introductory chapter, Luke was interested in portraying Zachariah and Elizabeth, the cousins of Mary, to be perfect to be that Jesus and John the Baptist were cousins and emerging out of the most impeccable family. And Luke chapter 1 verse 6 says that Zachariah and Elizabeth just never sinned. They kept all the commandments perfectly. And Luke did not care if he, whoever wrote Luke did not care for a moment of what consequences that statement would have for Pauline theology that no one can keep the law. Okay, I don't want to go off the rails on this, but this is all over the place. Jesus is walking around forgiving sin in the Gospels because a person had faith, like the paralytic, and it the writer or the the writers of the Christian Bible just didn't take into account the claim that no one can have an atonement for sin without the shedding of blood. Uh, and that's the whole point I want to show to you. You find this throughout the Gospels that each piece, each 
comma, each section, each story does not take into account the problems it creates in another story or another th- um, theological view. It just smushed together, okay? That's all over the place, and this is the case here. So by introducing virgin birth, while that idea is would have been very attractive to the pagan world, because after all, the gods, the the gods who were both men and divine at the same time, that was a tier of in the henotheistic system, they were all born of virgins. This was very attractive to the ancient world. Uh, the idea that Romulus, the founder of Rome, he was, couldn't be an ordinary person, but he was born to a virgin and eventually ascends to heaven. You know, Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great. How could people that great be just born to the ordinary conception of man and woman? This is a highly dualistic idea that seeps into Christianity. Now, how does the church deal with this problem? There are other problems that are ancillary but are related, and that is that Matthew's genealogy and Luke's genealogy are not consistent with each other. When I say they're not consistent, it's not, I'm not being picky They're entirely different genealogies. And very important, Joseph's father is Jacob in Matthew and Haley and Luke. It's just, and it's different all over the place. Moreover, Matthew's genealogy traces itself to King David's son Solomon, which is the correct person descent of David. David had more than one son. Luke moves through Nathan's descendants, and that's all wrong because Nathan cannot be the ancestor of the Davidic dynasty. It's only Solomon. As I mentioned to you, it's all over Tanakh. It's in First Chronicles and Second Samuel. It's really all over the place. Well, how did Christians escape this monumental problem? It's I don't envy Christians. They have to do, they have to engage in a theological circus act. Torturous answers are advanced. One is, as you mentioned, while Matthew is tracing the genealogy of Jesus through Joseph, Luke is tracing the genealogy through Mary. Okay. You don't know where to even begin in addressing this. First of all, this is not found anywhere in the text. There's nowhere in the book of Luke that tells us that the genealogy is that of Mary. It's just not there. So someone just made it up. Now, why would someone be so ambitious to invent that? There's good reason for it. What would be the motive for inventing this torturous argument? Well, the reason is because that solves the problem many problems. One is that you can have the tribal identity pass through Mary. You'll see in a moment how ridiculous that is. And number two is it solves the issue of Jacob and Haley. So therefore, Jacob could be the father of Joseph in the line of Matthew, and you can have Haley being the father of Mary. That doesn't, that's not consistent with the proto-gospel of James, but who cares? That's not a canonical text. Okay. It doesn't work because a mother's genealogy does not confer tribe identity. Ah, but I thought, Rabbi, that the way you know you're Jewish is by who your mother is, right? So what are you talking about? Isn't it true that only a mother can convey, can confer Jewishness? You know you're Jewish by who your mother is if your mother's Jewish, not by your father's Jewish. And that's true. So there are two pieces going on here. You know you're Jewish by who your mother is, and we have many examples of intermarriage in Tanakh. When people, when a person is the descent of a Jewish mother, Gentile father, that child is Jewish. And in contrast, in Ezra, tra- like um, Leviticus chapter 24, as an example, and in Ezra chapter 10, the or Nehemiah chapter 13, they have Jewish fathers, non-Jewish mothers, children are not Jewish. Forget about it. The next problem here is monumental. And that is, we are told explicitly in the book of Luke. That means when you say professors say this, or they're saying this because they're desperate, because they're drowning. And when you're drowning, when Christian uh, 
apologists are drowning and you're sucking in water, you'll say anything. The problem is that Luke specifically identifies Joseph as the one who's from the house of David, not Mary. Where? Luke one twenty seven. And I, I played with you. Look it up. The context is a census in the empire. A census where people have to go back to the town in which their ancestors came from. I don't want to go into the, this story is made up and is a plot device to get the family to leave Nazareth and go to Bethlehem where Jesus would be born in a manger. Um, I want to just leave that alone. Just very, listen very carefully. It says explicitly in Luke one twenty seven. if you're a Christian and everything's at stake for you, you really want to look this up. You're probably tired of taking a man's word for it, aren't you? Like, that's why I say look it up, because you spend way too many years not looking it up. And when you don't look it up, you get into trouble. So I'm giving you the source, and I'm get, bringing a, a hostile witness. I'm bringing the book of Luke itself, the very same book that we're told that Mary was from the house of David, and therefore she's conveying that to Jesus. That's not found in the book of Luke. Rather, it is Joseph that was from the house of David, and that's why they had to return. It's not Mary. It's not Joseph and Mary. It's Joseph. Okay? It's, that's not happening in Luke, and this is just a torturous argument in order to explain away an existential problem to the Christian claim. Many people dismiss this claim. They shouldn't. They should take it very seriously. You know, as Mark Twain conveyed that when you start lying, you have to be very smart to keep track of all your lies. When you tell the truth, you don't need to keep track of it. You know that you're being sincere and loyal to the text. Now, Christians have come up with all kinds of odd answers to this. Incidentally, there are some Christian scholars who say that, no, Matthew was Mary's genealogy and Luke was Joseph's genealogy. It means they're all over the place here. He raises the point that Joseph could have adopted Jesus as Jacob adopted Ephraim and Manasseh. This is a very interesting claim. And I say it's interesting because no one's ever asked it, not because the claim has any basis in text. You'll see in a moment this is a nightmare for the church, an absolute nightmare for the church. So adoption does not confer, does not convey tribe identity. Okay? And there's nowhere in the Christian Bible that says that Joseph adopted him. Moreover, in order for someone to be adopted— that means someone gave him up for adoption. Moreover, which is very, which is unbelievable, Menashe and Ephraim were the biological descendants of Joseph, and Joseph was the biological descendant of Jacob. What, what comes into view in Genesis chapter 48, verse 5, is that Jacob is taking Ephraim and Menashe and giving them the same status as his other children. Remember that Menashe and Ephraim were born in Egypt to Joseph, and Jacob had not seen them as children, didn't see them when they were born. He comes to f- discover them later in his life when he comes down to Egypt. So Jacob ad- not adopts them like he's not biologically connected. In fact, if I use Genesis 48 verse 5 as a proof, Jacob was the biological answer, ancestor of Ephraim and Menashe. He, they were not adopted in that they were not biologically connected. So if you, if you try to access, this is why making stuff up gets you in so much trouble. If you try to access Genesis 48, verse 5, where Jacob says that these two sons, who are really his grandsons, biological grandsons, are to me as my other sons, meaning Reuven and Shimon, Reuben and Simon, what that means is that they get the same, they get a plot of land, and they have an equality among all the other sons. So they are his biological children. That proves that, that adopted children can't 
inherit the covenant. As you would see in Genesis 15, as I mentioned, that uh, Eliezer, while being devoted to Abraham as his servant, he still could not pass on the biblical covenant because he was not biologically connected to Abraham. And God says that it has to be someone who would come from your loins. You mentioned something else. I hear this all the time. This is like such a well-worn argument because Christians have to explain this away. Like, how do you how do you deal with the problem that only a father can convey genealogy, uh, not the mother, not a female? And, and the shocking argument, and this is an example of people who don't look it up. They r- get their information from a website, from Pastor Google. They look up some missionary website or goes to some missionary book, and they go, oh, Thank goodness I can keep drinking my alcohol. I can keep smoking my spiritual cigarettes. I can stay with Jesus because I have this missionary book. It really is a good idea to look these things up. So in in First Chronicles chapter two verse thirty four, we're told about someone whose name was Sheshon, who was from the house of David, who had only daughters, no sons. He has a slave. His name is Yarcha. He frees his slave and he allows his daughter to marry Yarcha. And we are then given in this text about 15 generations of this relationship. And Christians argue, aha. So here we have a case where a female marries someone who's not Jewish, and she has descendants from the house of David explicitly in First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 34 at all. What is Rabbi Singer talking about? Here we have, let me tell you something. If you think I'm making this up, it's in every missionary book. They've got to rely on this or else it's sunk. The credibility of the New Testament collapses, and along with it goes down the entire church and the claims of Christianity. You get their argument? The problem is outstanding. Nowhere is it said in the text that these descendants are considered the house of David. That's the whole point. In fact, it's, there's something even more interesting here. That is an illicit marriage. Why? Because we're told in Deuteronomy chapter 23, I'm specifically talking about verses 7 and 8, explicitly that an Egyptian who wants to join the the nation of Israel has to wait three generations. That means that that is a forbidden relationship, and that's why it's in 1 Chronicles 2. 1 Chronicles 2 is there to tell us about a relationship that should have never happened. An Egyptian, now, an Egyptian could cannot marry into the Jewish people for three generations. And therefore, what happened was he took an Egyptian and married him to his daughter. Now, why would he do that? Just as a side point is because the, the slave, this, this is not slavery as in 1840 Alabama slavery. It's not that. A slave or a servant in your house was someone that you trusted. It was someone that was part of your household. It's someone that you could put your confidence in. When Abraham was was told that he was going to have a, a, a dynasty from him and he had no children, his first thought was it was going to come out of Eliezer. See Genesis chapter 15, the first five verses. And God said, no, no, no it's going to come out. Of, so un- just understand this point. Servants are people who you, you trusted for everything. See, So here you had a man who had no sons. He couldn't rely on another brother to watch over the the inheritance and to watch over the estate of the family. So he could trust his slave. He could trust his servant. So he marries them. He gets them married. But that was an illicit marriage, thus marking the descendants as descendants of an illicit relationship, that they're not house of David. There's nowhere in the text that says what Christians say it says. It means Christians claim that the descendants of Yarcha, and then there's a person named Nathan, which is a third generation. No, that's not the same Nathan as son of David. Like, this is like such a scam. This is like such a sleight of hand. That means all you have to do is say to the missionary, please show me that these descendants of Sheshon are regarded as from the house of David. Nowhere. 
Now, that doesn't mean that they don't have children. They're just not from the house of David. And doesn't say, and they consider them from the house of David. The whole point is to say that these descendants were from the house of David. But it's nowhere there. That means, of course, their ancestor is from the house of David. That, but doesn't make them the house of David. And nowhere does it say, in Dick, and they were considered from the house of David. The whole point is absent there. So this is all a theological sleight of hand. It's altering text, playing with them. It's and people don't know. People sometimes who are like take advanced degrees in systematic theology have no clue, no clue at all. So this is all a game trying to now it's when I say it's all a game, when you hear this from a Christian, they just don't know any better. I, I don't want you to think I don't want to do to Christians what they do to me and assign ascribe all sort of motivations. They don't know any better. They want Jesus to be the Messiah. They've been praying to him. They've been talking to him all their life. And they don't want to think that they've been praying to no one. Worse, that they're worshiping idolatry. They don't want to go down. And when you're drowning and water starts to go into your nostrils, you'll panic. And when you panic, it makes your heart go faster, and then you need more oxygen, and it's all just the whole thing is collapsing. So, therefore, according to Luke, it was... It was Joseph that was from the house of David, not Mary, 127. It doesn't work. Christians are in a very bad situation. When, that's why the terrorist says, don't hear, don't take away. Because the moment you have a perfect system and you insert something into it that's alien, it, it doesn't just affect that. This is the system's theory in, in Scripture, and that is everything then collapses. You just can't keep track of it. You know, once you lie in your interview with the police in one area, that that means you can't sustain everything. The whole story collapses. Once the church would adopt the the notion that Jesus was conceived miraculously, and that only happens, as I mentioned, in the late first century, Matthew, Luke, both probably written in the eighties. Well, you then the whole thing blows up in your face. And it exposes Christianity for what it is, a religion that's man-made. It has no divine origins. I pray that you will look this up. I pray that you will uh, go back to the text I tell you about. I hope you will do that, to discover this, to come near to Hashem, to say, Hashem, I want something pure. I'm done with man-made religions. Turn to Scripture itself. Turn to Tanakh. Find Hashem. Draw close to Him and we will see the coming of the true Messiah quickly in our time. Great question, thank you.